Hello, I'm Veronique Mandel. Welcome to Scribes and Songsters. In the second half of the show, we're going to meet Sarah Jarvis, who will tell us what to expect at this year's Bookfest Windsor. We'll also hear music from LaSalle songwriter Martha Renault with local guitarist David Light. But first up, let me introduce you to a local writer who has had the unique experience of having a book on the New York Times bestseller list. Ellie Blake, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me here. Now, I'd, I'd like to sort of talk a little bit more about Ellie, but um, since I've only just finished reading this book of yours, let's talk a little bit about it. Frostblood. Um, it's, um, so how did this sort of come about? What, tell us the story. Of um, just of, of that particular book? Mm -hmm. Not this my one whole first. long writing journey. Um, <laughs> Well, I'll yeah. ask you about that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, well, I knew I wanted to write fantasy, um, but I, I think I had just was sort of, I hadn't fixed on an idea yet. And um, I actually did have a dream where there was a girl with power over fire and an, uh, a king with an icy heart. So that was like the nucleus of the idea. And when I woke up, I, within seconds, literally knew her name was Ruby, which is very strange. I normally don't dream book ideas at all. But um, I also had watched um, Avatar, The Last Airbender, which is an animated series, a few months before that. And it's all about elemental magic with like fire and water. And um, so I imagine that had something to do with me having that dream. Um, so then the nucleus of that was the dream, but then I sort of spun ideas from there. And the storyline, I know what it is, but for those people who have not yet read your book, what's the storyline? Uh, so it's a medieval-based fantasy, and it's about a 17-year-old girl named Ruby who has the power over fire, but um, that is not allowed in the kingdom where she lives, so she ends up in prison and is rescued by a couple of Frostblood rebels, and she becomes the key weapon in a plot against the king. I've uh, really enjoyed fantasy for a long time, and I really like the writers like Marion Zimmer Bradley, but and I have to tell you, I really enjoyed... Uh, oh, frost blood and at one point I usually sit down and read a book in a session and I put I had to put it down because I had things to do and I kept thinking uh, and uh, about getting back to the book because I wanted to find out you know whether or not um, the male destroyed the female or whether they <laughs> kind of came to a conclusion <laughs> oh thank you so much that's but, wonderful to yeah, hear it, it was really that. good <laughs> now of course it's part of a trio Yes. Trilogy. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Tell, me, tell us about the others. Uh, so I've written the second book. I just sent off um, the last version of that um, a couple days ago. Congratulations. And, oh, thank you. Uh, it took me longer than it was supposed to to write it, but it's done, so that's good. Um, and it, it still follows Ruby, and we're going to learn more about um, the Fireblood history and the Fireblood people. And um, she really has to confront who she is and what she wants to be in the future. Um, so of course she's gonna have lots of things thrown at her and there's still lots of action and uh, you know romance and all that stuff. And your third? The third one is coming out June 2018 um, and um, the title is Nightblood and I still have to write that one. <laughs> I'm just about to start it. I always like to ask authors if they like their characters. Do you like your characters? I love my characters, yes I do. I don't, yeah, I don't always know that I'm living up to what's in my head when I'm writing, but I certainly love my characters. I, I adore them. Yeah. People might wonder, where does the, the blood thing come from? So the, the blood is um, part of the elemental magic in this world. Fire bloods have the power to control and create fire. Frost bloods have the power to control and create ice and frost. So that's just, and they're called frost bloods and fire bloods. Did you one day just decide I want to write a trilogy, or did it just sort of come at one book at a time? Um, I, it was sold as a trilogy, so it was intended. I had brief synopses for book two and three, which were not written. Um, trilogies just were, you know, a popular thing, especially in young adult, mm -hmm. and um, something that I enjoyed because once you get to know the characters, there's always that period when you're first starting a book where you don't know the characters or what's happening, and you kind of sometimes are kind of forcing your way through because you're learning a lot of backstory and things. But then once you know the characters, I feel like you're pulled in and you want to keep going. And that's 
the beauty of a series that you already know all the characters and the backstory, so you've done all the work of getting to know them and bonding with them, and then you can just be carried through the story. Yeah. Do you find that sometimes your character takes you to a place where you, ha you had not intended? All the time, yeah. I'm what's called a pantster. I write by the seat of my pants. I try to plot, and I, I do I do try my best to plot, but it just doesn't come naturally for me. And even if I outline ahead of time, I'm always going off road and then wondering what happened and how do I, do I want to keep going with what I've been doing or get back to my outline? And there's a lot of rewriting in my process. So yes, I definitely, um, they, they do unexpected things all the time. Do you do a lot of research? I do research um, more as I need it. So mm -hmm. I have certain things in mind or I've already read things that sort of inspire a scene. So I know a few things, but since I'm a pantster, I sort of do the research as I'm, just when I need to write that scene, then I'll go and do the research ahead of time to put the flavor into it. And do you look at things like, um, what would be the interaction of someone, you know, who had this fire thing going, uh, and the reaction of uh, that fire on ice? I mean, do you, do you sort of do the chemistry sort of thing? Yes, I try. I try to um, see it visually and, you know, see and hear what the sounds would be and, you know, cover the senses kind of thing um, and, and think about the logic. And I've definitely um, changed my mind on certain things that I thought didn't work and tried to refine that. And I'm often um, bouncing ideas off my husband because he has no choice. He lives with me, so <laughs> <laughs> he has to listen when I have questions. And um, yeah, so he helps me sort of refine things like that. Now, as I mentioned in my intro, you are on the New York Times bestseller list. Yes, it was on for four weeks, um, which was phenomenal. Pretty phenomenal, yeah. Yes, and um, it was one of those, it's a, kind of a life dream thing, I think, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and. Um, it didn't hit the first week. I didn't even know whether to kind of wonder if it would hit the list or not. I, I didn't, you know, this is all new. This is my debut and I didn't know what goes into that. But when it didn't hit the list, you know, the first week, the second week, the third week, I kind of figured it was not going to happen. So it hit, I believe, on the fifth week after it was out, which is somewhat unusual. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of, it was a wonderful surprise. Yeah. So I, how did you find out? My editor, um, Deirdre Jones with uh, Little Brown, she called me on the phone and I didn't know the phone call was coming. So I just happened to be, I was cooking dinner. I was stirring a pot of spaghetti. And luckily my 15 year old son was in the room so that I could say, Nicholas, can you stir this? Cause I figured, you know, my editor doesn't just call me out of, out of nowhere. So, um, so then I, you know, found a quiet spot and she said, you might want to sit down. <laughs> and, uh, and I did. And she told me and I immediately started crying. And then I found out that it was a conference call with like the whole office all oh. listening. <laughs> so I was, you know, <laughs> there you crying were. openly with the whole Little Brown uh, team there, but they were all wonderful. They were all so happy and excited and yeah. What does it mean you know, to sort of get that kind of recognition? Well, it's really a wonderful thing because for an author, because I can put that next to my name for mm -hmm. the rest of my life, I, you know, New York Times bestselling author. So it's, incredibly gratifying to to have that um, and I'm extremely grateful yeah just so grateful and uh, and excited that that happened when you um, sit down to write um, do you assign a number of hours for yourself or is it sort of <coughs> ad hoc or uh, pantology <laughs> right my husband's always trying to Darren's always trying to get me organized and and have me assign Any hours to write. <laughs> <laughs> just thinking of what he's thinking right um, uh, no, I tend to assign a day, and I know that's a writing day, because I don't know how long it'll take me to get my mind in the zone. And um, I know, it, you know, it is a discipline, and the logic is sit down and write, and there's truth to that. But sometimes anxiety can be a big thing, and it really stops your creativity, and you can feel really paralyzed because of anxiety. So I have days where it takes me hours to get past that and get in the zone and that might not happen till the afternoon. So it's really good for me to have a complete full day to write. Um, and then the productivity, it just sort of depends on how much my mind is cooperating that day. But I'm, I'm always trying, I, I designate the times and I'm trying, I'm throwing myself at it, but I don't always know how productive that's gonna be. Because that paralysis um, is really <clears throat> scary when uh, 
you, you sort of get into the writing and you think, I feel productive today, and you sit down and you're absolutely paralyzed. That's exactly yeah. it. Yep, the terror just comes over you and your mind blanks and then and then, you know, you have all these little techniques to try to get over it, but it depends on the day. So that's mm -hmm. how it is for me, not for everyone, but that's, you know, my experience with writing. Well, I hope you have few paralyzing days <laughs> so you can get uh, the other books finished really oh, soon. Thank you so much. And uh, where can people find your book? Um, at any major retailer, um, you know, independent bookstores are great. To, it's great to support, you know, local bookstores, but also Chapters Indigo um, in, in the U.S., Barnes & Noble. I mean, all the brick and mortar, all the online retailers. So, yeah. You can Everywhere. See. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been oh. such a pleasure to uh, talk to you, and I really look forward to reading your next books. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me here today. Oh, it's a great pleasure. <laughs> And now let's meet Martha Reno. Martha is a singer-songwriter who lives in La Salle. She has so far produced two albums, Lifelines, released in 2015, and Time and Tide in 2016. She has been described as a true balladeer who weaves a vibrant tapestry of strong songwriting with a warm delivery that touches the soul. And we're going to let you hear a song from that visit courtesy of Sun Parlor Coffee House Sessions. Martha is accompanied here by local guitarist David Light. I hope you enjoy it. An unlikely pair that you ever would find out on the prairie in the great divide Trying just to get through another dry day And trying just to keep those old wolves at bay Well, you might think that they don't go together Just because they're not birds of a feather Well, sometimes there's just things you can't know Like when little bird found a prairie buffalo Yes, little bird found a prairie buffalo Little bird had got herself caught in a storm She was blown off course, now all tattered and torn Grounded by an injured wing and waiting to die Cause there's no hope for a bird that can't fly And sometimes you might think it's all over But you don't know what's coming round the corner, no Sometimes help comes in a way you can't know Like when little bird found a prairie buffalo this little bird found a prairie buffalo. Do 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 Something quite small just caught his eye Yes, sometimes you might think it's all over But you don't know what's just around the corner And sometimes cries, they can be heard Like when Buffalo found a pretty little bird Yes, Buffalo found a pretty little bird Well, little bird's healed and she's flying so high Well, now she's Buffalo's second set of eyes He's her warmth at night now that they're together They go through life no matter what the weather An unlikely pair that you ever would find Out on the prairie in the great divide Trying just to get through another dry day and Trying just to keep those old wolves at bay Well, you might think that they don't go together just because they're not birds of a feather Well, sometimes there's just things you can't know And sometimes friendships, they just grow And friends are just friends just because it's so Like when little bird found a prairie buffalo Yes, little bird loves a prairie buffalo And buffalo found a pretty little bird Yes, buffalo loves his pretty little bird do 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 
Welcome back. That was the very talented Martha Reno from LaSalle with guitarist David Light. They performed Little Bird and Buffalo. Joining me now is Sarah Jarvis to talk about Bookfest Windsor 2017. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I have to say that when I first heard that Sarah Jarvis was one of the people instrumental in sort of getting all of this Bookfest thing going, uh, and getting it running, I have I was not surprised because you see, I've known Sarah for a long time. You had a very successful run at being a bookstore owner. That's right. Yes, yes. We had a little indie store in Amherstburg. Yeah, and did th was that s sort of something that got you started? You know, or, or propelled you when it came to this Bookfest Windsor thing? It certainly got let me get to know people in the area uh, with the wonderful Lenore Langs, who's a one, who's a, a founder of Bookfest Windsor. She used to bring a van load of people to events and author events that I had at the store, and so we got to know all the local authors through her, and uh, that was very helpful. Dan Wells as well, who is also um, who's now with Biblio Biblioasis. So. Uh, another founder and I had met him. So before that, I was inspired actually by uh, a poetry festival that happened in Scotland when I was living there. And the impact of listening to these professional playwrights and poets, Sorley MacLean and, and so many more, um, reading aloud from their work, it, it was just dynamic. And I was just so excited by that interaction with the audience and with the reading audience as well. It brought the words to life. So now, how did Bookfest actually sort of come to life? I came as, um, this was a little bit before my time, but it started around uh, 2001, 2002. Before that, Lenore and some friends had been running a program called Ways Goose, which was a gathering of poets, and she would produce a chapbook out of that. And then eventually they became incorporated as Literary Arts Windsor in 2002, and Bookfest became a regular festival, the main festival of Literary Arts Windsor. Well, it's interesting, and in a, in a sense, Cape Breton and Windsor, Ontario, you don't sort of, you know, think uh, on, on, in the same sort of cultural genre, but yet you have this great love for this kind of a festival, and uh, you sort of have, you know, both of these communities doing it with volunteers, which is really something. Yeah, as Carl Jurgens has said, you know, Windsor punches above its weight mm -hmm. in terms of literature. And I love to quote that because, and it's the same thing with Cape Breton, the culture is there and, and we seem to be in our own little island here and, and the storytellers here are, are um, it's a tremendous uh, groundswell uh, mm -hmm. of, of people who... And, you know, you bring in some really well-known artists, and I'll get you to tell me about some of them in a minute, but sort of, but I notice that you also incorporate local authors. We try to do that. We try to give people uh, a step up onto the festival circuit. And we do that with authors from all over Canada. But if we find a good fit with an author, a local author, um, and if we feel that we can give them enough exposure that they don't already have locally, uh, then we, we do our best to incorporate them. And uh, we have on-site bookseller, which now is Biblioasis, and we support Mod even uh, people who are moderators of sessions, we have, uh, they tend to be local authors as well, or um, local interviewers or journalists, and uh, we try and support their book sales at the festival as well. So we try and balance a, a little bit. What I uh, appreciated about uh, sort of being one of those people one year was the opportunity to be on a panel with some sort of really um, brilliant, established writers uh, across the country. Tell us about some of the uh, the writers you've had. Uh, some of the writers we've had have been extraordinary. We've had two Booker winners, man Booker winners, and in one year we had them both at the same time. Uh, actually, we've had three. Uh, Margaret Atwood, obviously, she's come a, a few times, and also we had uh, the year that Eleanor Catton won. She's born here in Canada, lives mainly in New Zealand, but she does come back and forth. Um, and we've had uh, bestsellers such as Christopher Paul Curtis, who is, is really one of us. He's connected to this 
uh, he's a Newbery Prize winner, and uh, Nino Ricci is a strong supporter as well. And so, so we're very fortunate in the caliber of authors that we have coming through BookFest. We also uh, have authors who have really made it big since they've been at Book Festival, And that's part of what I was saying, that we, we help them authors get onto that circuit, as it were. And early authors include Louise Penny, Lawrence Hill, who came back mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and filled a theater and uh, just, uh, you know, very generous with his time. So uh, we really like to have that part of helping to nurture authors onto the next step, as well as so we can bring in audiences, bring in uh, well-known authors as well. Having these well-known authors come to BookFest, are you finding that they're spreading the word? Do they sort of, or, or do they tell you, you know, what they think of BookFest? They do, and it's usually quite fulsome. Uh, the Governor General's Literary Awards in Ottawa last year, um, we had um, uh, an author just say, BookFest is the best festival and sitting at the same oh, table were, were several <laughs> other literary festival organizers yeah. so I was very I was very grateful for for that those kudos um, and um, we get emails back thanking us for our hospitality people love Windsor they love meeting the audiences and they love that we're a very intimate um, uh, festival in that people can actually meet the authors, have a conversation, they go have coffee sometimes. Um, uh, so you never know what's going to happen. There was one spectacular year when a publisher and author uh, put together a contract right in the ladies lounge of the Capitol <laughs> Theatre. So it's, it's very intimate, it's very hands-on and um, people, the authors love it and, and they go and tell their friends which is wonderful. You hear so many people today say, you know, when I talk about writing books, well, why are you writing books? Nobody reads books anymore. What's your sense of that? I find that people are reading and writing more than ever. Uh, we, we can't stop telling stories. Mm -hmm. And there was the rise of the e-book, and that's still happening, and it's still convenient for the, if you're traveling. Uh, but now, you know, print books are back on the rise again. And um, we certainly, it, it's that book as artifact, I think, as, as when people can hold a book, meet the author, then the author touches that book, writes in it, and gives it back to them. It's a wonderful uh, tactile experience. And then the book becomes a, sort of a treasure in, in people's lives. So um, I, it's just not going away. We can't stop telling stories. No, I agree. And I have to tell you, there's a different feeling when you're reading a book in bed and the book falls on your face or when something electronic falls on your face. Yes. I know what's more pleasant. There's nothing ruder than your e-reader sort of beeping at yeah. you when the battery goes down and it's like, Whoa, what happened? And, and your books just don't do that to you. you know, mm -hmm. Worse, you might just drop it and lose your place, but you can find your place. And I have to ask you, as a former bookstore owner, are we, I mean, we have some very successful independent bookstores in Windsor right now. Are we going to see more or do you think that, you know, the big conglomerate has really sent them away for good? I feel that uh, they're going to stay around as long as, as the smaller bookstores keep providing the service and the local atmosphere. And it's that idea of a third place. Um, when chapters first started up under another management, they tried to do that with the couches. They become the you know there's the the home work and the third place was the city square. They tried to do that, didn't work so well, but it still works with the smaller bookstores that create an atmosphere, that offer the one to one service. And uh, I as you know, if print books are still going, then those bookstores will still. Go there because again, it's about the passion of the people who run them. Mm -hmm. um, in Windsor, I know that I often have five things on the weekend all scheduled. Do you work with uh, other organizations to make sure that you're not overlapping? 
We try to do that, yes. Difficult in Windsor, isn't it? It is, it is. Yeah. And um, so much happens. There's mm -hmm. always something on the go. So we, we try not to step on toes. So uh, have you lined up some authors yet? We have. We have, uh, um, we've got a wonderful poet, uh, up and coming poet, Julia Cameron Gray. Uh, our theme this year is the next 150, which we totally stole from the wonderful Gord Downey. Um, and uh, we've got some other poets coming and that's always a strong part. We have Lyndon McIntyre, who's a best-selling mystery writer. He's got a new topical mystery coming out. And uh, CBC journalist Carol Off has a, a very striking new book about peacekeepers that she will be telling us about. So she's coming. Uh, we have a francophone session as well. Uh, David Boucher and his translator are coming to do a translation both in French and English. And uh, just all kinds of wonderful authors that we've lined up. Uh, I'm going to hopefully pronounce this correct. Uh, an, a, um, a Calgary professor called Nigu Wan Duem. Uh, James Sinclair is coming as a consultant with a book called The Locksleys and Confederation that we are hoping to take through the schools and present in a very dynamic, dramatic way in the schools as part of our Canada 150 celebrations. Well, it starts like the beginning of a very good lineup. It is. Yeah. And the date. The dates, thank you. The dates are October 20th to 22nd this year. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we'll really look forward to it. And thank you so much for coming in and, uh, and uh, talking about it and sort of giving us a sense of the history of BookFest. It's a delight to be here. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Well, that's it for another show. Join me again on Scribes and Songsters when I'll introduce you to more of the very talented writers and songsters in Windsor and Essex County. I'm Veronique Mandel. Thanks for watching. And friends are just friends just because it's so Like when little bird found a prairie buffalo Yes, little bird loves a prairie buffalo And buffalo found a pretty little bird Yes, buffalo loves his pretty little bird Do-do-do-do-do-do-do